It's like extreme trial and error. I'll show you this in the laboratory. We've made a robot that you can give it instructions and it makes really complex oil droplets that look like they're alive. I make salad dressing a lot in my lab. And in fact, salad dressing is probably the most important thing for the origin of life. That is oil in water. But they're not alive, they just move a lot. They were orchestrated. It was a cheat, a setup, a bribe, whatever. <laughs> but then we say, okay, because we, we, we know what instructions we needed to do to make the droplets look alive, how can we now move the information from the robot to the chemistry? Within a few hundred million years, there's evidence in the fossil record that life formed simple cellular life. Those two facts are not, as far as I know, disputed by those, the science Those, science those are not contestable. How we got from the point A to point B? Absolutely, includes, but I didn't includes. say. I did not say, <laughs> okay. we knew. Right. That's so the so we're agreeing, okay. we, so we keep, you and I agree, Lee, that how we got from the simple molecules to life, it happened, but we don't know how. Exactly. So let, In this ooze emerged the first life. I find it problematic in that there's an extrapolation from a very small experiment in a laboratory. Researchers have now created life from non-living parts. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. I'm boiling up some primordial soup. Your entire civilization, it all begins right here in this little pond of goo. And let's check in with Lee one more time regarding membrane self-replication and protocell evolution. As a quick disclaimer, in this clip Lee uses the word cell a few times in reference to simple oily protocells. He is not talking about modern living cells with genomes. The important thing here is we were able to show that we can combine catalysis with molecules that would make a material that was cell-like and that would drive the replication of the cell. So nothing other than a bit of catalysis um, and um, because cells form naturally like oil and water. So you just take some oil and put it in water and get little blobs. So all we did is we synthesized some molecules that would auto-catalyze their own formation to make oil. So what you have is you have this basically water and in this water over time um, oil droplets start to appear. And when they start to appear, they were better and better at making more of themselves. And they got bigger and bigger and bigger until they just naturally underwent a replication event. The surface tension of the oil was such that it splits. So what we showed is that you have this process where you naturally make daughter cells with no information. You know, no DNA required, no genetics required, no complicated machinery. So that we could get replication before genes. And that is a very important right. process to have in the available repertoire of chemistry. So, and, and that was just from autocatalysis. So, autocatalysis makes an organic molecule. That organic molecule becomes an oil. That oil grows and grows and grows, that droplet, until it's so big, it naturally undergoes fission to make two daughter droplets that can then carry on, carry on in, in the life cycle process. A really important thing to understand is when the first organic oil droplet emerges, that acts as a crucible or a, or a nursery in which other oil droplets are born and that just happens with no information in the environment just spontaneously so for for james to say that cell, cell formation is fantastically incredibly difficult is ignoring the laws of physics because it's basically surface tension and the gravitational force on earth and the availability of the sun and all this stuff that allows these things to work very nicely yeah first of all this autonomous what does autonomous mean can mean undertaken or carried out without outside control. That's the implication, that this all of a sudden happens by itself. Well, let's, let's look into the details of that paper. Here's one of the figures from this paper. So he has these molecules, he's getting a condensation reaction to occur. So one of these has a long tail on it, the other doesn't, and he gets a condensation reaction to occur. And then this goes round and round, and you get more condensation reactions occurring. 
And that's one of the things that's happening. That's this autocatalytic cycle, big whoop. I mean, it's, there's, there's nothing really fancy here. And uh, uh, it's, it's going around this cycle and, and making what he calls oil. Now, this would never be work in a normal lipid bilayer. You have to have dialkyl, usually diacyl units, in order to stabilize it enough. Secondly, his inner and outer layers, if you had watched my video, you might have learned some organic chemistry, Lee. The, the inner and la outer layers are the same, so it's not a protocell in the sense that it could ever be a model of a living cell because you'd never get a proton gradient because the inner and the outer sides are the same. Exactly what I said in the last video. Every protocell experiment has the inner and the outer sides exactly the same, so it could never, never be the origins of an early cell. They'd have to be different. Nobody knows how to make them different. So then he goes on. Now, this is this reaction that runs by itself, by automated, he doesn't mean that it can run without outside influence. He means that he built a machine to do it. Now look at all of this stuff that's involved in this machine, including one of the things is that you need a chloroform solution. Chloroform. How is that any relevance to early Earth? Uh, that, that's that's re really kind of interesting. But in any way, droplet experiments were carried out on an in-house built liquid handling robot equipped with 250 microliter syringes, an improved version of chemo robotic platform and used in previous work by this lab. The robotic platform con consists of a movable XY carriage. I mean, there is so much here. Where would this ever be available on an early Earth? But look at all of what's given here, all of the things that you have to do. And he has his eye here, and so you can watch this. Remember, autonomous, by autonomous, Lee means that he built a robot to do it. He doesn't mean that this is something carried out without outside control. His lab is trying to do origin of life experiments, and his lab has more investigator control than any lab that I've ever seen. From the pure chemicals that they use to the to the robotics and the tubes just going in this and perfectly timed, it's wild how much this has user input into it. Let's see what's involved in prokaryote cell division. Dave does not like me to use eukaryotes. He wants me to use prokaryotes because they're much simpler cells. It would already be dishonest enough to pretend that the first cells had to be as complicated as modern bacteria. But no, he shows us all the ultra complex inner workings of modern eukaryotic cells and their interactome, which he drones on about for 20 minutes. Once again, these cells did not evolve until well over a billion years after the first prokaryotic life came about. This is not applicable to this discussion, period. What's involved in prokaryote cell division? Prokaryotic cell division is a process by which a cell divides into two or more cells. The process of prokaryotic cell division is called binary fission, which is a simpler process than found in eukaryotes. Recall that prokaryotes differ from eukaryotes due to the lack of a nucleus or cell organelles. Typically, their chromosomes consist of a single loop or circle of DNA. The circular DNA molecule replicates. It then attaches each copy to a different part of the cell membrane. The cell grows to twice its size and the membrane pinches in the middle. The cell can now undergo binary fission. Binary fission is the prokaryote form of asexual reproduction. After the cytoplasm divides, each daughter cell synthesizes a new cell wall, creating two identical cells. Binary fission results in two cells that each contain one copy of the original circular DNA. Prokaryotes are able to multiply rapidly because of their small size. Their DNA takes a short time to replicate, and with a high surface area to volume ratio, they can absorb nutrients quickly. Also, the relative simplicity of the cell's internal organization allows rapid duplication. A bacterium can divide every 20 minutes in optimum conditions. Unchecked, bacterial population growth is exponential, allowing rapid colonization of a favorable environment. Okay, so here's what you see. You see a cell which duplicates itself and gets DNA on both sides, and then it divides in the middle, and you get an exact copy on this other side. Yes, there, there, there can be small mutations, but, but you get a copy of it. And this is what, what, what cell division is like. What Lee describes in his paper has nothing to do with this. So this is from Lee's own paper 
is we're looking from a camera on the bottom and he's got this dish and he's putting some of these into the dish and he's saying that this is like cell division, but it's really not like cell division. But let's just take a look at this. Okay, so he's putting some drops in there and he's saying, oh, look at this. Look at this oil and water. This kind of looks like, uh, this is like, like cell division. Boy, this is cell division. This is, this is what we've got here. This has nothing to do with cellular-like division, Lee. It is standard Marangoni effect of oil in water droplet splitting. That's all it is. And you say, well, well, could this really be true? Yeah. Well, let me show you just from the internet. So he's putting a little oil in there. He's adding a little bit of dye, just like Lee did, so that you can see it, so that it shows up a little bit better. So you add a little bit of dye to that. And now watch this thing break up. That's it. The oil droplet just breaks up. Now he's showing us in slow motion. So this oil droplet breaks up to minimize the energy and, and uh, minimize the free energy. And you, this is Marangoni effect. And that's all it is. That's all it is. That's all that you did. And you claim that this is some protocell experiment. It has nothing to do with it. This is not like a, a, a cell division. This is just an oil and water droplet. And you see the way this thing was fluffed up in his research article? Plus, where did he get these chemicals? Let's see what's involved in that. Well, here's page one. This is what he needed to set up for his autocatalytic reaction. Reactions that happen all by themselves. Here's all the things that he had to do, and he had to have all these pieces of equipment, each one of these being over a million dollars, each one of these pieces of equipment. And so he has to start synthesizing things. So to a solution of paranitrobenzoyl chloride. Where did he get that? He bought it. Uh, that's not standard on an early earth. And he added this many to dry dichloromethane, not a prebiotic relevant chemical, in a solution of 2-amino 6-bromopyridine. He bought it not available on early earth, in triethylamine, not available on early earth, in, in dry dichloromethane was added dropwise with stirring. The mixture was stirred 18 hours at room temperature. Water was then added. The organic layer was washed with water, dried with saturated sodium bicarbonate solution, uh, and dried under sodium sulfate. The crude product re was recrystallized from methanol, and uh, then it was taken on, and, and, and uh, he got a melting point on it. Now he has to go through the characterization, exactly what I said on my first video series, that you have to go through all the characterization to know what you got. Now is he ready to go into his autocatalysis? No. He has to go and do more synthesis. Here's page three. Are we done? No. He has to go to page four, do more synthesis. Are we done? No. He has to go to page five. This is all in the experimental. Dave, you never looked here, did you? You had to go, to, you had to click on the supplemental data and get this. Here's page five. Are we done? No. Page six, done? No. Page seven, done? No. You, you're starting with alkynes and dry hexane and N-butyllithium. N-butyllithium on an early earth? Oh, that's really early earth relevant. I mean, these are crazy type compounds to use. Page eight, are we done? Are we done yet, Lee? Page nine, no, we're, we're still not done. No, we're just going on and on. Okay, now here's the end of the experiment. 10 pages of synthesis he had to do to set it up. Autonomous, undertaken or carried out without outside control. Autonomous means that Lee had his PhD lab workers spend months using modern synthetic methods of synthesis, purification, and analytical determination using multi-million dollar pieces of equipment. And only then, can his graduate students then build robots to use these things? In some senses, uh, uh, any chemical reaction is autonomous in that when I mix compound A and compound B and they form a new bond, I didn't push those two together and form it. It happened by itself, so it's autonomous. Is that what you want to say? I mean, where are you going with this, Lee? You see the type of nonsense that gets propagated by this? And you aren't just going to suddenly magically make a protein in a soup of elements, are you? No, you're not going to magically make a protein in a soup of elements. You are not going to do that. That's what Dave thinks can happen. Do you believe in magic? <laughs> you can just take a bunch of amino acids and throw them in there. I agree with you. There is no spontaneous assembly of a protein. I agree with you. Lee, teach this to Dave. Well, it was hilariously stupid from top to bottom, so I'll need If you had watched his first video, you never would have gone on his channel. Never. If you watched Dave Farina's first video on abiogenesis, you would have thrust your face into your hands in disgust.
Tour has more expertise than I do in chemistry, obviously. Right. He's right. a chemist. Now, let's look at some things that Lee Cronin has written. So he wrote something called Finding Life the Universal Way, and this was recently put on this uh, blog called primordialscoop.org. So what does he write? A key issue that many chemists assume that complex molecules can spontaneously form for free. This is only possible in very rare situations producing one molecule that cannot be detected. To understand this, we need to go back to coin flipping arguments. You are going to have to flip a lot of coins and then only make one copy of the molecule. The possibility to make complex molecules is not innate in the universe. There are no magic kinetic pathways. This means if you go and check for complex molecules around the solar system, you find something you will be sure to say that life was there for sure. So what is he saying? He's saying exactly the opposite of what Dave Farina teaches. When proteins first began to form, the sequences were random. What are the odds that they would have a particular amino acid sequence? Very, very low. What are the odds that they would have some amino acid sequence? 100%. That's all there is to it. So this attempt at a quantitative analysis of probabilities is completely misleading, and people who put this argument forward have no understanding of biosynthesis or, honestly, of probability in general. He's saying that you might, by chance, make one, make one of a molecule, but it's so little it can't do anything. You can't make another one of those. That's what he's saying. You can't do this by, by coin flipping arguments. The only way this could happen is if there had been life there to make it. Let's see something else that he writes. Quote, this view tells us that complex objects that are formed in abundance have had a rich causal history. Think about the steps to produce an iPhone. If you found an iPhone, you could infer that it was designed, produced in a factory, that it had several million different elements, many chips, and each chip has had a lineage, unquote. Well, Lee, you sound like an intelligent design proponent. But suppose I had found a watch upon the ground. You'd naturally assume it had a designer. Would we see the complexity of it and notice that its parts seem to come together in a particular way in order to accomplish a goal? Things like watches, computers, complicated things that look designed are designed. The inference, we think, is inevitable, that the watch must have had a maker. That writing tells me that you find something complex, uh, it means that, that there, there was some designer behind it. That's, it had a rich causal history. Whether you want to call that a designer or a rich causal history, Lee, you're in the ID camp. <laughs> What I'm going to try and do in the next 15 minutes or so is tell you about an idea of how we're going to make matter come alive. And what I'm going to try and do is plant some ideas about how we can transform inorganic dead matter into living matter, into inorganic biology. And in fact, the smallest unit of matter that can evolve independently is in fact a single cell, a bacteria, becoming very close to understanding the key steps that makes dead stuff come alive. And again, when you're thinking about how improbable this is, remember, five billion years ago, we were not here, and there was no life. So what will that tell us about the origin of life and the meaning of life? But perhaps, for me as a chemist, I want to keep away from uh, general terms. I want to think about specifics. So what does it mean about defining life? We really struggle to do this. And I think if we can make inorganic biology and we can make matter, become evolvable, that will in fact define life. I propose to you that matter that can evolve is alive. And this gives us the idea of making evolvable matter. Thank you very much. A quick question on timeline. I mean, you believe you're going to be successful in this project? When? So, the, so many people think that life took millions of years to kick in. We're proposing to do it in just a few hours, once we've set up the right uh, um, chemistry. So, and, and when do you think that will happen? Hopefully within the next two years. <laughs> that would be a big story. <laughs> that was in 2011. How's it going, Lee? How you doing with that? It's been 11 years, so you should have made life many times. You think your little Marangoni effect of, of, of oil and water? No, that's already known. That's been known. That wasn't making life. Nope. 
You think your little autocatalytic reaction of rust was making life? Mm -mm. Not even close. Not even close. Nobody takes that seriously. You tried to make a bunch of polypeptides heating up to sterilization temperature, and you didn't even make polypeptides. You made a bunch of garbage that nobody cares about. And this misunderstanding has come because of the projections of those who work in the area of origin of life. They do one little thing, and then they extrapolate it, and then they work with the press to ramp it up even more, and they project as if they really know it. And so the layperson reads this and says, ah, you see, scientists understand. But I don't think it's fair to put the blame on scientists. The blame belongs to the press. The way science news is reported today is absolutely abysmal. Sensationalist reporting of science news, no matter which way it leans, is destroying public perception of science. But the blame is with the media outlets, not with the scientists. Dave thinks it's just with the press. You brought on the scientist. I think the problem is also with the scientists. So, the, so many people think that life took millions of years to kick in. We're proposing to do it in just a few hours, once we've set up the right uh, um, chemistry. So, and, and when do you think that will happen? Hopefully within the next two years. <laughs> that would be a big story. So Dave Farina and his expert Lee Cronin are responsible for the world thinking that people have made life in the lab, because Lee goes around saying it. He says that he's going to do it, and he says that other people have already done it. All the people that have made life in the lab have cheated. They have taken existing building blocks, and those building blocks were produced by evolution. This is on you, Lee Cronin. This is on you. It is your fault, your fault, that the world thinks that people have made life in the lab when we're nowhere close. Orbital diagrams to and you, Dave, the are the enabler. You enable these people to do it. I think Lee is a good person. I really do. I just think, I just wish that he would learn about this and he wouldn't over extrapolate from this. Dave, I'm not sure that he's teachable at all. Like, it, it's not gibberish to me. I may have to look into stuff a little bit, but I, I understand the fundamentals very well and I explain them very well. But we have a lot more to do. We have a lot more so called experts to go after, a lot of things that we have to address here. Remember, Lee, what you're going to have to deal with, you got to see where homochirality came from. Show me homochiral glucose. Has anybody ever made glucose homochiral in any prebiotically relevant manner? No, just glucose. Uh, how about the mass transfer problem? Lee, how do you start with, say, a kilo of material? Say you had a kilo of material. How do you take it through to all the steps you got to take it through to get life? How are you going to get more of that? The whole mass transfer problem in synthesis kills you. Talk to your, your postdocs who do the organic synthesis in your lab. Ask them. How about the mixture problem? How do you deal with those billions of compounds and fish out the one you want to use? I mean, I mean you're using recrystallization and chromatography in your, in your lab. How did, how did early Earth do this? What about the source of information? You think information is irrelevant? Where does this information come from? I'm talking about real life information. How about protein folding? or the Leventhal Paradox 2.0, which is the interactomes, the non-covalent interactions that have to be there in a cell. How about chiral-induced spin selectivity? How are you gonna deal with that? You don't even know what that is. Maybe you better go back and watch my video to see that you had to have had life. What's being shown now with chiral-induced spin selectivity, what's being shown now by, by An Naman, the discoverer of chiral-induced spin selectivity, is that you have to have had near-perfect chirality at the start of life. It's not something that you could have evolved into. Dave in his video likes to just say, oh, he just blows it off. He says, this is something esoteric that Tour talks about. No, just because you can't answer it doesn't mean that it's esoteric. It is a real thing. Address that. What about removing human intervention at each step? Your lab is full of human intervention. This is something that Reichert has shown and written about. Everybody says, well, why don't you write articles about origin of life? I do. I put them in the journal inference. Uh, but, but Reichert put it in, in Nature Communications. Nobody pays attention to him. He says, you got to take out the human element. And you guys, all you do is put in human element and you, Lee Cronin, more than anybody else. How about cell assembly? How about my challenge? Why didn't you address this? You went on Dave's video. Why didn't you address my challenge that if I gave you all of the materials, all of the carbohydrates, all of the lipids, all the nucleic acids, all the proteins that you want in any order, so I'm giving you the information. Could you assemble them even in your pristine lab? And the answer is no, because remember, what you have to have, you have to have all of this. You have to have all of these pieces. This is the minimal gene. It's much less than what we see in the earliest cells that we can isolate. The earliest cells, fossil record of cells, have much more function than this. 
but this is what you have to have for a minimal cell. This has been computed. You're going to have to have DNA replication, repair, restriction, and modification, basic transcription machinery, amino, amino acyl tRNAs, and all of these, boom, 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 all of these for the minimal cell. So that kind of wraps this thing up. Next time, we're going to analyze comments and work of Dave Farina's other experts in Origin of Life. And we'll deal with them one by one. We'll just take them down one by one. And then after we finish all his experts, then we'll go after Dave's, Dave's comments as well. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. And that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, it's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work. And if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.